Good morning. The Subcommittee on Military Construction and Veteran Affairs will come to order. We're delighted to um, have uh, with us the uh, Secretary of Veteran Affairs. And uh, we've got a lot of questions for you and a vote coming up in about an hour. And I know the members of the committee all have questions for you, Mr. Secretary. And uh, we're delighted to have you here and, and appreciate your service to the country as uh, each and every one of you. We're grateful to your service to the nation and our men and women who uh, have served our country so faithfully. Uh, and I'd like this time to introduce my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Bishop, for any statement he'd like to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've done a lot to ease the burden of military service. For example, Congress passed the 9-11 GI Bill, the Hiring Heroes Act, and the Caregivers Act, all with very strong bipartisan majorities. Uh, however, we're still struggling in one area that can make a world of difference to a veteran, and this is the area of the claims process. Uh, we have a serious problem in the country uh, when there are over 850,000 veterans awaiting compensation claims and over 600,000 that have waited in excess of 125 days, uh, commonly referred to as backlogs. Uh, I've heard from many on the reasons for the backlog and the inclusion of Agent Orange, the winding down of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the complexity of the new wounds, both physical and mental, uh, to our veterans and, and others. But what I want to hear today and what I'd like to discuss is what's actually being done to fix it. I want to talk about results and how this FY14 budget is going to achieve those results. Uh, how are the initiatives and funding in this budget going to meet the department's goal to end the backlog by 2015? Uh, because we can talk about increases in spending for VA until we're blue in the face, but there's, if there are no results, then we're just wasting time and resources. Mr. Chairman, when it comes to wasting resources in this current budget climate, I can't tell you how frustrated and how disappointed uh, I am and many members are uh, in the recent announcement on the Integrated Electronic Health Record Program. Uh, less than a year ago, Mr. Secretary, you and Secretary Panetta appeared before uh, Congress uh, promising uh, to develop a single, common, joint electronic health record uh, that would, according to your statement then, unify the two departments' electronic health record systems into a common system to ensure that all DOD and VA health facilities have service members and veterans' health information available throughout their lifetimes. Uh, I'm aware of the uh, statement that was uh, issued uh, within the last uh, 48 hours by uh, Secretary Hagel, but I personally believe that DOD probably shoulders much more of the blame uh, in this area than the VA, and also much more of the wasted cost. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I'm very, very weary of the promises made to the members of this Congress on behalf of veterans with no results. So, Mr. Secretary, when I talk to veterans, the number one issue is always VA claims. And the number one issue being worked by my staff in our district offices is VA claims. The veterans of my district are growing impatient, and so am I. So, Mr. Chairman, today is a very important hearing, and I know I speak for many of our colleagues and for Secretary Shinseki when I discuss how frustrated we all are with the situation. I know this is a problem that won't be fixed overnight, but my hope today is that we can focus on how we fix this problem together and how we fix it quickly. Uh, not just for the veterans waiting today, but for future generations of veterans to come. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to share my concerns, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, my. Uh uh, sentiments are, uh, sh sh I share those sentiments with Mr. Bishop. It is just truly unacceptable the length of time it's taken to handle the disability claims process and the uh, absence of a unified uh, electronic medical record is something that's absolutely got to be uh, solved immediately. And it's my pleasure to introduce and recognize the distinguished chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Chairman Culberson, for yielding me this time. Secretary Shinseki and your staff, uh, thank you for being with us today to discuss your uh, 014 budget. Uh, in other subcommittee hearings, I've already lamented the fact that this budget is uh, woefully late. 
uh, and in its totality, it, it got a lot of gimmicks, uh, tax increases, generally unhelpful, but we will persevere. Uh, let me begin by taking this uh, opportunity to thank the service and sacrifice of the veterans that you are representing here today. As this subcommittee has done in the past, we want to uh, reaffirm our commitment to providing our nation's veterans with the benefits they deserve. The Department of Veterans Affairs budget we will be discussing in detail today provides the funding for VA, uh, medical care, compensation, benefits, as well as education benefits, vocational rehab, and housing loan programs. We have the responsibility to ensure that after serving our nation with dignity and honor, uh, our nation's veterans receive the best care available. Along with other members of the subcommittee, uh, I share the concern about the backlog uh, of uh, disability claims. While there's been an unprecedented demand uh, after 10 years of war, changes to PTSD and Agent uh, Orange eligibility and other revisions resulting in 940,000 veterans uh, added to the system over the last four years. It, it's woefully unacceptable that 70% of these pending claims are over 125 days old. That's especially disconcerting as this subcommittee has gone to great lengths to make additional investments in processing and efficiency. I am, however, encouraged to hear about recent uh, contract awards to speed electronic document conversion, and I'm hopeful that uh, you can quickly build on these steps to significantly reduce, if not end, the backlog by 2015. You may recall that uh, last year, uh, I and other members of the subcommittee emphasized to you how important we feel it is for the VA and the Defense Department to create an integrated electronic health record. We were encouraged by the progress both departments seem to be making uh, on that effort, but uh, I understand now that uh, you and DOD have opted to create two separate record systems uh, that would be interoperable. Uh, we hope that you'll be able to convince us that this revised approach uh, will produce the same result without delays and without increased costs. Finally, as you and I briefly chatted before the meeting, uh, prescription drug abuse, uh, nation's fastest growing drug problem, remains one of my top priorities. The Center for Disease Control calls it a national epidemic. It's killing more people than car wrecks. Just simply prescription drug overuse and abuse. In the past several years, we've had many discussions on how we can better help our veterans uh, prevent uh, prescription drug abuse or offer assistance to those facing addiction. And I look forward to continuing to work with you as we tackle this uh, epidemic. And I know uh, our, our active military and our veterans uh, are sort of in a different uh, posture in re relation to this problem. Uh, because of the multiple moves they've had to make in their career with, in different theaters and different hospitals and medical care around the world. And I know that presents extra challenges uh, for you, but uh, this is a deadly problem that I know that you're working on, and I appreciate that. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my privilege to recognize the uh, distinguished ranking member, uh, Ms. Lloyd, from New York. And I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would like to thank you and Ranking Member Bishop for holding this important hearing and welcome Secretary Shinseki and all of our distinguished guests this morning. As the subcommittee works on the FY 2014 bill, we have to help the Department of Veteran Affairs address very serious challenges. We must ensure that the men and women who have faithfully served our nation receive the recognition and benefits they earned. We can never renege on the promises made to our veterans. Mr. Secretary, I commend you on the excellent work you have done in the past four years to substantially reduce veteran homelessness. 
I'm also pleased with your progress to help facilitate a smoother transition from active duty to civilian <coughs> life. But as you've heard from my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, I cannot express how outraged I am with the veterans' claims backlog. As you know, there are currently up to 600,000 veterans waiting 125 days or more to have their medical claims processed. The VA's annual claims receipts are expected to re reach 1.2 million in 2013, an increase of almost 60% since 2005. On Tuesday, I asked Secretary Hagel about the Department of Defense's role in the claims backlog. Both departments, in my judgment, and I didn't know it was resolved, Mr. Chairman, but in my judgment, after hearing a lot of testimony and talking <laughs> to many people, it seems to me they must use either the same electronic health record system, which is preferable, or ones that work seamlessly with each other. I asked Secretary Hagel how he plans to help the VA to reduce this backlog, because frankly, there are many people with whom I've spoken that, that put the blame on the Department of Defense for not getting their act together and working seamlessly with your system. He told me, Secretary Hagel, that DOD would decide on an electronic medical records plan within 30 days. So I look forward to hearing about that. Uh, I just want to submit these pictures in the record. I probably should have blown them up, but I can't believe it. Boxes and boxes of records. I don't know if you've seen them, Mr. Secretary. These are claim folders in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'd like to ask you all later when I ask a question if you've taken a look at that. And if you have, how do you sleep at night? Boxes and boxes of records in Winston, North Carolina. This is, if you'd like to see them, I'll pass these on to you, but I'm submitting them for the record. It is really here. amazing to me that um, these exist and these brave young men and women who are serving our country, many come back without limbs, without a mind, without a brain, have to sit in a box. Uh, now, I know everyone here, everyone in this room, you've heard from all my colleagues, wants to fix this shameful problem, yet it persists. I just hope at this point we can all work together to address this pressing issue. And I look forward to hearing your testimony, Mr. Secretary. I thank you again for our service to your country. And I do hope that the new <coughs> Secretary of Defense deals with you and gets this done, because the public just can't get it. You know, if we can go to war and we have an extraordinary military, we can't solve this problem and get these records out of the boxes. It's just wrong. So uh, enough. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Lowy. Um, Mr. Secretary, I know that you and your staff are, uh, can see clearly that we are all of us on this subcommittee and in the Congress arm in arm in complete agreement that this, uh, the backlog is unacceptable, that we have, uh, as a Congress, we know that we've made massive investments in the Veterans Administration, exempted you from the sequestration. You've seen a 16 percent increase in the funding for your budget uh, in the uh, mandatory programs. Uh, tremendous support from the Congress and unanimous, um, adamant uh, feelings on our part that this has to change. The, the backlog has to change and the electronic medical records uh, need to be unified. We know you've done your part as best you can on the medical records. but. We look forward to your testimony. Uh, we encourage you to summarize it. We've got votes about 1130. Um, and uh, help us focus on the problems that we can help you solve. We want to hear, obviously, about the successes. But talk to us about the problems. And uh, we uh, appreciate very much your service to the country and look forward to your testimony. Your entire statement will be entered into the record uh, in its entirety. And we look forward to hearing from you, sir. Thank you.
thank you <clears throat> chairman culverson uh, ranking member bishop uh, chairman rogers ranking member lowy uh, other distinguished members of the committee uh, thank you for this opportunity to present the President's 2014 and 2015 advance appropriations uh, requests for VA. We deeply value your partnership and support in providing the resources needed uh, to uh, assure the quality of care and services we provide to veterans. Uh, let me also acknowledge uh, other partners who are in the room today, some of our ver veteran service organizations, whose insights and support make us much better at our mission of caring for veterans, their families, and our survivors. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to take a minute and introduce uh, others who are here at the witness table with me. Uh, to my left, far left, your right, is uh, uh, Mr. Steph Warren, our Acting Assistant Secretary for Information and Technology. Uh, to my left is Todd Grams, our uh, Chief Financial Officer. To my right is Dr. Andy Petzl, Under Secretary for Health. To his right, Allison Hickey, Undersecretary for Benefits, and then to the far right, Steve Murrow, who is Undersecretary for Memorial Affairs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for accepting my written uh, statement for the record. Uh, let me just say very quickly, the 14 budget and 15 advance appropriations requests demonstrate the President's steadfast commitment to our nation's veterans, and you all as well. I thank the members for your resolute commitment uh, to our veterans as well. Um, for the budgets that we have worked together, and I seek your support on these requests. The latest generation of veterans is enrolling in VA at a higher rate than previous generations. 62% of those who deployed in support of operations in Afghanistan and Iraq have used at least one VA benefit or service. VA's requirements are expected to continue growing for years to come. Our plans and resources must be robust enough to care for them all. The President's uh, 14 budget for VA requests $152.7 billion, $66.5 billion in discretionary funding, and $86.1 billion in mandatory funding, an increase of $2.7 billion in the discretionary account of about 4.3 percent above the 2013 level. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a strong budget, uh, which enables us to continue building momentum for delivering on three promises we made nearly four years ago now. Uh, the first was to increase veterans' access to VA's benefits and services. The second was to go after this thing called disability claims backlog, something that's been building for decades, and we committed to ending it in 2015, and we've put together a robust plan. We're in execution of it, uh, still targeted on 2015. And the third promise was to end veterans' homelessness in this country, this rich and powerful country. And we targeted 2015 uh, for accomplishing that. These were bold and ambitious goals then. They remain bold and ambitious goals today because veterans deserve a VA that advocates for them and then goes and fights and puts resources and, uh, behind its uh, promises. Access. Of the roughly 22 million living veterans in the country today, more than 11 million now receive at least one VA benefit or service uh, from VA, an increase of over a million veterans in the last four years. And this is part of that access, increasing access for veterans. Uh, we have achieved this by opening new facilities, renovating others, increasing investments in telehealth and telemedicine, sending mobile clinics and vet centers to remote areas where veterans live and using every means available, including social media, to connect more veterans to VA. Increasing access is a success story for VA. Backlog. I hear the comments of, of the uh, members of this committee. Too many veterans wait too long to receive benefits they deserve. There's no question about that. We know this is unacceptable. It's unacceptable to me. And no one wants to turn this situation around more than this secretary, more than Secretary Hickey, and more than the workers at VBA, 52% of whom are veterans themselves. And so they, they have an interest in this. We are resolved to eliminate the claims backlog in 2015, not just reduce it, end it. When claims will be processed in 125 days or less, that's our 15 measure of success, at a 98% accuracy level. Our efforts mandate investments in VBA's people, processes, and technology. And so very quickly, people, more than 23,000, uh, 2,300 
claims processes have completed training to improve the quality and productivity of claims decision. More are being trained and VBA's new employees now complete more claims per day than their predecessors. Processors, processes, use of disability benefits questionnaires or what we call DBQs, online forms for submitting medical evidence has dropped average processing times of medical claims and improved accuracy. There are now three lanes for processing claims, an express lane for those that will predictably take less time, a special lane, special operations lane for the unusual cases or those requiring special handling, and then a core lane for the, for the remainder, which is the majority of claims. Now, technology is critical to this process as well, people, process, and technology. Technology is critical to ending the backlog. Our paperless processing system, the Veterans Benefits Management System, VBMS, will be faster, improve access, drive automation, reduce variance. 36 regional offices today are using VBMS. We are targeted to complete the fielding of VBMS by the end of this year. All 56 will have it. And we are pulling that fielding plan as far to the left as we can. Finally, homelessness, the last of our three priority goals has been to end veteran homelessness in 2015. Since 2009, we've reduced the estimated number of homeless veterans by more than 17%. The latest available estimate from January 2012 is 62,600. There's more work to be done here, but we've mobilized a national program that reaches into communities all across the country. Prevention of veterans homelessness, prevention of veterans homelessness will be the follow-on main effort. Right now, it's rescue and getting people off the streets. It must be accompanied with a prevention program that keeps more veterans from ending up there. So finally, Mr. Chairman, we're committed to the responsible use of the resources provided by the Congress. Again, thank you for this opportunity to appear here today. I regret the lateness of a submission of our budget, but I thank you for your support of veterans and of our request. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. In the interest of time, I'll keep my questions fairly short and to the point in order to give everyone a chance to visit with you before the vote occurs. The um, uh, number of claims and being submitted have increased every year. The new automated system is still not operating nationwide. You've been working on this for years, promised us for years that this would be uh, resolved. Uh, you say you're still on target to hit that uh, 2015 uh, deadline. Uh, but the number of completed came claims continues to fall below projections. The average number of days it takes to complete a claim continues to grow, and uh, accuracy levels are still below all the um, targets that you've set. Uh, what is different? What are you doing differently that would uh, enable, what is the a, uh, VA doing differently that would enable the committee to believe that you can meet your goal of no claim taking longer than 125 days and claims determination being accurate in 98% of cases. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just describe what we've been about. And it, it's a robust plan, and uh, Congress has been very supportive. And we are executing that plan as we speak. Now, if we can think back uh, four years ago, uh, our system was paper because <coughs> we received paper. Everything <coughs> we received from DOD is in paper. Um, the, the records, uh, the Congresswoman, uh, 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 demonstrated in Winston-Salem. Uh, my understanding is today those records have been cleared up. But uh, needless to say, those are records that follow uh, members around their tour in the military, and that's what we uh, receive uh, uh, for processing. Uh, this is what we're trying to change, this juggernaut of paper that comes our way. Uh, veterans submit their claims in paper, uh, usually accompanied by some of those records as well. Um, and so we have to change that. We have hired more claims processors throughout the years, and still the number of claims, because after over a decade of war, uh, uh, continue to grow. And so we have to change our approach here. And what we have developed is a movement to automation. In order to move to automation, we have to create an automation tool that others can uh, send electrons to. Uh, DOD has agreed to do this. By the end of this year, we'll be receiving electrons. That's their commitment uh, from DOD. So all that paper that's been coming our way is beginning to change. Uh, we have over 800,000 claims in paper today. Um, 
The ones that we have begun processing will continue in paper and finish up. Uh, the ones that we think are able to be scanned and put into the database uh, are being scanned. That is uh, a work in progress. Uh, and what we have been about here for the last two years is developing an automation tool that has the capability and the power to make this transition. Uh, we have done that. That program is called VVMS. Uh, we are fielding it today. We're in 36 of the 56 regional offices. Uh, as I said, we had set aside this entire year to field 56 uh, uh, locations. Uh, my guess is we're going to be uh, finished mm -hmm. early. And when we have that system in place, an automation tool, and DOD feeding us electrons, and veterans now have an ability to file online, provide us their claims electronically, and scan in the documents that they would like to submit for consideration. Uh, we, we are in the process of uh, creating a major transformation. Yes, sir. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, my uh, question, though, is what are, is the VA doing differently or new that would uh, and uh, convince the Congress that uh, you can meet this 2015 deadline. And I didn't, I didn't. That's that. With all due respect, sir, that's basically the same things we've heard for the last many years. And I uh, would then ask. Um, I have to say, based on the on the performance so far, uh, and the continuing increase in the amount of time it takes to to uh, handle a claim, the continuing uh, problems, the tremendous increase in funding that we have given you, and all the support. Uh, and love and encouragement we can give you, and we still haven't seen any changes. Uh, I can now see why some of my colleagues have said that the, the VA should be required to simply turn uh, claims processing over to the private sector with a performance-based contract that would make funding contingent on speed and accuracy uh, metrics. Under this scenario, current VA claims processors would have to compete for their job with the private sector. Uh, with a private company that would win the competition to uh, process claims. So the goal here is to serve veterans. The goal is to ensure that our veterans are given the, uh, the uh, support and the help that they have earned through their service to the country. And um, the, the work is so vital and so important. I just don't see how we can simply uh, continue the way we have. Um, and I, I am certainly open to, in fact, uh, 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 based on everything I've seen and heard in the, in the time that Chairman Rogers has entrusted me with this extraordinary uh, privilege of being the chairman of the subcommittee, I just haven't seen much change. So why shouldn't the Congress go ahead and uh, change the law in, uh, by 2015 and 20 months if you haven't met your deadline, create a situation where the private sector can step in and handle this uh, for you and those folks that are not doing their job with the VA just simply turn over the responsibilities to a, a private company to make sure that our veterans are given the benefits that they have earned. Fair enough, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, what I've described is a robust plan here to accomplish what we all want, which is no veteran should have to wait for any claim that's uh, for disabilities that uh, they've uh, earned and incurred, and I think we're all committed to that. Uh, uh, this is an ambitious plan. At the same time that we began this transition of VA, DOD, and all the inputs, we also added to our workload to take care of some unfinished business. Vietnam veterans, Agent Orange, uh, for 47 years had not been recognized for three key diseases. We added that to the workload, knowing that it was going to increase inventory and, and slow the backlog or increase the backlog. Uh, we testified to that uh, two years ago and uh, three years ago. And we said that uh, this was the right thing to do. And we were going to do it, accept this increase, but we were going to work through this and develop an automation tool, VBMS. It's in, in, uh, in the process of being delivered. We also, 20 years ago, for 20 years, we've not acknowledged Gulf War illness for uh, veterans who served in Desert Storm One, and a variety of, of uh, uh, indicators that they had health care issues. Uh, never recognized, but uh, three years ago, we said we were going to do something <coughs> about it. For the first time ever, we <coughs> don't have a clear cause of these uh, maladies. Yes, sir. Uh, in the past, we've always said we're going to find a cause before we grant. Uh, we decided there were nine diseases that had a sufficient enough population for us to say we don't know what caused it, but something obviously happened. We will treat those symptoms and then deal with the disability claims. Yes, sir. 
my, my, my question was, though, why shouldn't we in Congress go ahead and create a mechanism to let the private sector compete for this in 20 months? Your deadline is 2015. If you can't meet it, we'll go ahead and let the private sector come in and step up to the plate. And then I'll turn it over to Mr. Bishop. Well, I think we have indicators now that are what the, the plans, the plan we have in place and the results we're beginning to see uh, are beginning to uh, bear fruit. And I think this will continue to show uh, over the, uh, uh, certainly over 2013 and into 2014. I remain confident that 2015 is a good target for us. Uh, we've done uh, employee training uh, and uh, more claims per day are being completed, a 30 uh, percent increase in accuracy. We've, as I said, segmented lanes uh, where we have a fast lane and a special lane and a, and a lane for the vast majority of uh, claims. Uh, productivity incre increase there has already a uh, 10 percent increase in, in offices that have uh, gone this route. Uh, disability claims uh, questionnaires has speeded up processing. Uh, increase our production by 60,000 claims. Um, uh, we are moving to a rules-based uh, engine for the VVMS program that we are currently fielding. Uh, as soon as we're done fielding it, we're looking for the opportunity to insert a rule-based sort of a, uh, a, uh, a device like a TurboTax uh, uh, capability where the right data fills the blocks and uh, decisions are made and uh, checks are cut. Uh, 52 calculators for uh, 15 disability body systems that are reviewed uh, are integrated into VBMS and we expect that accuracy alone there will rise to 92 percent. Um, you know, I think we have a, a good plan in place. It's a robust plan. We've been building it for uh, uh, two years now. We've just begun fielding VBMS six months ago, mm -hmm. and we're in 36 locations. Well, you know how strongly we support you. The committee of the Congress has given you everything you've asked for to do what has to be done so that our veterans who have earned these benefits can receive them in a timely fashion. And I have to tell you, if it doesn't happen, and uh, I, I think we should look at uh, radical yeah. uh, restructuring and some changes to make sure those, those men and women get what they've well, earned. And, Mr. That's Chairman, a, it, it, you really got to rethink this. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, I thank you uh, Do something for, different. for the support of the Congress. I mean, it's been crucial. Uh, but just so we, we're not sitting here thinking there's nothing happening, uh, we've averaged a million claim de claims decisions going out the door for the last four years. So when you're talking about a claims inventory of about 870,000 claims, okay. uh, the backlog is uh, clearly, uh, you know, larger than it needs to be at roughly yes, 600,000, but when you're putting a million claims out the door with an inventory of 870,000 claims, uh, there, there is work being done. It Thank you, sir. It's not a static number of claims sitting I, there. I need to move to Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary. Well, I, I share the, the chairman's frustration. Um, I, I do have some uh, serious reticence about uh, suggesting that contractors could, uh, could do the work. Uh, our experience with DOD uh, and with uh, most of the agencies uh, where we have uh, utilized contractors has that contractors have cost significantly more uh, to the government, to the taxpayers, uh, to produce uh, the results that were done by uh, the civil service uh, employees. Uh, that's been documented particularly in the Department of Defense. Uh, so I, I, I'm not so sure that that would be the uh, the, the stick that we would hold over, over the department's head, but uh, we are very, very frustrated and we expect that something has to be done. Uh, but one of the, another item from your testimony that caught my attention, uh, which I guess uh, uh, just highlights the challenges that you face, is that uh, the average number of claimed conditions uh, for recently separated service members, uh, which is now in the 12 to 16 range, uh, is an increase in the number of disabilities claimed by veterans of, of earlier years. Uh, do claims processors have to have all the claimed conditions verified before the claim can be processed, or as conditions are verified, the claim for that condition approved? 
I, I think the, uh, the increase in the number of issues per claim is uh, reflective of the complexity of the operation. Uh, the fact that we have uh, improved uh, battlefield medicine and evacuation, mm -hmm. uh, we have many, many more uh, surviving uh, the injuries that uh, uh, have traditionally been associated with warfare. And sure. therefore, uh, uh, folks who return to us uh, have uh, more complex injuries and more issues to be dealt with. So that, ma that means that it takes longer for the claim to actually be developed and but in the process, and you can submit it for the record or, or get back with us, uh, but I'm interested to know whether or not if they've got these multiple issues, uh, if all of those issues have to be developed in order for any of the claims to be processed. It's Which it, it takes longer. Um, I, I think uh, they wait until the end to, 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 to rule on the claim until they've dealt with all 12 to 16 uh, different issues as opposed to some that are clear and some that are not so clear? Yeah. What, what, what we do is if there are that many uh, issues with a claim, uh, we will decide those that are, are clearly uh, resolvable and make those decisions and, and uh, begin to address the disability uh, claim statements. But by the current rules, if you take care of 14 of the 16 and, and uh, the veteran is being cared for and being uh, compensated, uh, because those uh, two remaining issues are still unresolved, then the claim remains open and it counts as a, as a backlog claim, mm -hmm. even though you've completed a good portion okay. of the work. And I, I can provide a greater detail. Thank you. For the uh, uh, that that uh, is some explanation, <laughs> but, but, uh, but not satisfaction for, for why uh, uh, you f you're experiencing the challenges that you are. I want to get back to the uh, integrated electronic health records uh, uh, again, um, I mean, you and your department and the Department of Defense were directed uh, uh, repeatedly by Congress to develop an electronic health record system that would follow a service member from enlistment uh, to the time that they exited. Uh, but because of the, the problems that, that, that you and Secretary Panetta uh, uh, encountered, you decided to alter that original goal of the <coughs> IEHR and to focus on making the systems more interoperable. Uh, VISTA will be your core system. Um, have you been given any indication of what core system the Department of Defense is going to choose? And with Secretary Hagel being familiar with the VISTA system, given his time at the VA, uh, have you recommended the VISTA system to DOD? And what effect would having the same system uh, have on your claim backlog? And I noticed that in your 2014 budget request, you included $251 million for the IEHR. Uh, can you explain what that money is going to be used for since you have altered the original goal uh, for the IEHR? Uh, certainly, Congressman. Uh, this has been a, a, an ongoing discussion now between Secretary of Defense and Secretary of VA for at least four years. Uh, let me just say, I spent 38 years in uniform. And in those 38 years, uh, I knew there was a VA, but I didn't know what the VA did. And so, frankly, my whole focus in uh, my time in DOD was preparing to go on, on mission. And, and that's the mission they should be focused on. And taking care of soldiers. And, and uh, our, our responsibility then is between the departments yeah. to ensure that we're being supportive of uh, DOD's uh, responsibilities here. Uh, as I've said before in testimony, very little of what we work on in VA originates here. Most of what we work on origi originates in DOD, and that's, mm -hmm. that's not a negative. That reminds us of our important link uh, between VA and DOD. It's not a link I understood for 38 years and until I came here. And so the earliest discussions with Secretary Gates was uh, this effort to change the relationship. And, uh, and that's been underway between the two secretaries. The culture in the two departments are, are a little different because of their national security mission. But we have worked very hard in the last four years to bring the two departments together. And one of the signature efforts has been this electronic health record. We agreed. Uh, in the past that that electronic health record would have certain keywords associated with it. 
single joint common integrated electronic health record. All of that uh, code to ensure that we stayed on a very uh, focused approach to resolving this issue. We added to it open in architecture, non-proprietary in design. And, uh, and all of that was, again, to focus us on a solution that would be a single record that we would both share. DOD agreed with the non-proprietary? Uh, that, that definition has been agreed to. And w uh, my discussions with uh, Secretary Hagel shortly after his arrival was uh, he wanted uh, uh, you know some time to get into his own department, figure out how that translated, make sure it had the right structure in place. And I believe uh, that's what you're receiving testimony about. Um, he has decided to make some adjustments uh, to the structure, and then he and I will meet. I look forward to that. Your system is not proprietary, but the DOD system uh, in the past is proprietary. The government owns your system. Yes. We, are, we have full control of it, but the one that's utilized by the DOD is proprietary and uh, I, I'm less contractors. So. Yeah, I'm not quite as familiar with the uh, DOD's current contract, but I believe that's correct. That is a contractor-provided uh, system. But ours is government-owned, government-operated, and uh, in fact, we've taken our code and put it into the open architecture uh, so that anyone who wants to has access to it and can use it. Um, I believe between DOD and VA, we have the opportunity to create an electronic health record that has these dimensions to it uh, that will benefit, you know, <coughs> many others in this country who couldn't afford to do the kind of research uh, development uh, that we do. And, you know, we just, both of us look forward to being able to uh, uh, provide that. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Chairman Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the uh, claims uh, backlog, uh, I know now that you're you're moving rapidly to digitalize uh, the claims, which which I think is the only way to go. That that allows you to uh, move these cases so much quicker, and I salute you for that. Uh, I, I think that's uh, the, the the right way to go. On the electronic health records, you know, uh, since uh, 2008. Uh, between DOD and uh, VA, we've spent about $537 million to create this integrated electronic uh, health record with very little to show for it. Uh, the, the effort was made to combine the two into one. Uh, that apparently has fallen by the boards, and now uh, apparently we're trying to integrate the two systems to make them interoperable. I, am I generally correct in that statement? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have two uh, records today, yeah. and we have created a, uh, a, a what I call a GUI, a graphical user interface that allows a physician <coughs> to pull data out of each system. So if I'm seeing a veteran and I want to see what's in his uh, military record, I can reach into DOD's uh, database and get that information. It's awkward, it's slow, uh, but it is interoperable and you can make it better. Uh, but it isn't where we want to go. We, we are looking uh, at a single uh, electronic record that is seamless between us. Um, and I, you know, I, I just think in the long run that uh, serves both departments and uh, I look forward to my discussions with Secretary Hagel. We don't want to end up again with a decision that has two records that in time uh, get developed in ways that no longer talk to each other. Because we know that the speed at which healthcare improvements are occurring, we're going to want to add capabilities. And, uh, and we need to do this in a seamless way so that each of us have a record uh, that reflects those in improvements. Well, you and I have shared this information before about the young man that came to see me a few years ago, two or three years ago, a veteran from Iraq uh, had been in an IED explosion to his head, face, uh, uh, ruined one eye, but the other eye was reasonably well. But then it began to deteriorate after he became uh, after he came home. He went to the Lexington VA hospital. Uh, they were unable to uh, operate to save this eye, 
because they could not get the records of the DOD when he was first treated after being injured. And they were afraid to operate again here in the head area because they, they just didn't know what they were facing. As a consequence, he, he lost the, the second eye. Uh, th that's unforgivable. Uh, I, I know you and I have talked about this before. And there must be a lot of cases just like that that are happening today. We, we just simply can't uh, violate the, the honor that our soldiers have given to us by that kind of ineptitude. Uh, tell me that that won't happen today. Well, I uh, would tell you, uh, first agree with you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, that's, that's a horrible reflection of two departments uh, being unable to uh, provide the uh, information where we can deliver health care. Uh, we are working. Uh, as I say, today we're better than we were three years ago. We now have this ability to pull out of <coughs> each of our databases. It isn't good enough. We're headed to a, uh, a seamless system where we can share that information uh, back and forth across our boundaries. There are active duty soldiers who are treated in uh, VA facilities, and then they go back to uh, Department of uh, Defense uh, uh, service. Uh, we, we have to be seamless here, and uh, this is what we're working towards. Uh, your statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, about that should never happen again. Yeah. Well, th th this has human consequences, what we're talking about. It's not, it's not just in electronic information. Uh, let me touch briefly, Mr. Chairman, if I have the time, Certainly. on, on a, another problem that really bothers me over the years, and that's prescription drug abuse. Um, and I know you uh, are working in this arena very, very much. One of the things that um, I think we could do is to... Uh, require mandatory physician training on the dangers of <coughs> prescription overuse. Uh, the, uh, the rate of uh, prescription prescriptions for medical problems in the military is skyrocketing. Um, after the uh, 2010 report of the Army's, quote, pain management task force, uh, DOD announced plans to expand drug testing uh, for uh, unauthorized prescription drugs. And uh, we've seen a huge increase in the reported symptoms of PTSD, uh, strongly associated with uh, substance abuse and dependence. Um, the uh, pain reliever prescriptions written by military physicians quadrupled between 2001 and 2009. Um, I know we've had the combat-related injuries that requires these medicines. Uh, and I know that it's difficult for us to judge whether or not the problem is solely related to an increase in the number of injuries received in warfare. But having even included that in our uh, calculations, we are seeing a, a huge increase in the number of overdoses of these medicines. Um, I appreciate your efforts to uh, uh, bring the VA online with our state-run prescription drug abuse uh, monitoring programs. Now 48 states have those systems in place, and you have now uh, linked up VA with those monitoring programs, which I think is a huge step forward. Um, currently, uh, one in six vets, I'm told, Returning from the war zones report symptoms of PTSD, one in six. Um, I'm sure uh, you share my fear that as these wars wind down and our 
men come home, men and women, we could be faced with a very serious problem, that even beyond what we uh, have today. A 2012 uh, Institute of Medicine report prepared for uh, DOD uh, recommended that we better prepare our military health providers to recognize and screen for substance abuse problems. Uh, do, do you think that additional education uh, for our doctors, nurses, about the risks of these prescription painkillers, do you think that would be helpful? Uh, or have we gone there already? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to call on Dr. Petzl here in a minute. Uh, I, uh, let me just uh, summarize. What you're describing here is a an issue that concerns all of us, and I would say that NVA, we've asked ourselves the question about over-medication. Uh, but again, uh, all, all that we've talked about, an uh, integrated electronic health record that allows us to see what's happening in DOD as people transition out, a mandatory transition assistance program where everyone leaving the military has an opportunity to have an exit physical exam uh, so that when uh, they come to us, they come to us because we know there are issues to be dealt with as opposed to discovering uh, when someone's in crisis that uh, uh, over-medication or substance abuse is an issue. The, the law precluded us from being able to do state monitoring before uh, the chairman's leadership here, and with the law, we are now able to participate. Regulations in place, and we are in the process of, uh, of executing uh, what, what we've described as uh, the right outcome. Uh, with that, let me uh, call on Dr. Petzl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I also want to add my thanks for the legislation that allowed us. This is an important step in uh, getting control of the issue of uh, the overuse of uh, opioids, particularly by the veteran community, and avoiding the social consequences and the physical consequences of, of that kind of addiction. Let me tell you what we're doing in addition to that. We have, in, in terms of the treatment of pain, we have a stepwise pain program that begins with the, the least harmful, the least risky therapies that include acupuncture, et cetera. And opioids are at the very end of that stepwise process. We've educated every one of our medical centers around this and are working to educate our primary care providers, particularly in our community-based outpatient clinics, which is where much of this uh, problem exists. The, the second thing is that we've developed a, uh, a data set that identifies veterans who overuse opioids and prescribers who overprescribe or are outliers in terms of prescribing. That information is fed back to each medical center and there's an individual who's identified as being responsible for following up on each one of those outliers, be it a patient or a provider, to see that the issue is addressed with the individual provider. I would say that Further, there's never enough education about these things. So can we do more in terms of education? Absolutely, we can. Mr. Chairman, just in closing, I would uh, just uh, say that uh, uh, veterans uh, enrolled with or enrolling with VA are all surveyed when they uh, come in uh, for their visits, and they're interviewed about uh, alcohol use, uh, interviewed about uh, substance abuse, about uh, insomnia, about pain and pain management. All of this trying to identify whether or not uh, there is someone uh, in need of uh, help. Well, uh, we had the problem in the private sector outside the military. Uh, particularly in my district uh, where OxyContin was, became the, the killer drug. It's a wonderful drug for severe pain, 12 hour release. But when young people learned they could crush the pill and shoot it up and get that 12 hours in a split second, it was an immediate high uh, and extremely addictive. Uh, we now have required all opioids to have an abuse deterrent feature, meaning that you can't crush it. It's a gummy thing that you can't abuse. However, uh, a lot of our doctors, not knowing the dangers of OxyContin, began to prescribe them for the toe ache or what have you. And uh, they beca we became hooked and we lost thousands of our young people, particularly in my district. Uh, and uh, it was not 
isolated to the civilian sector. Uh, there were a lot of military people, uh, veterans especially. So uh, this is something that uh, is deadly. I think it, uh, it feeds the suicide increase rate that we see in the military and the veterans. Uh, it is related, of course, to PTSD. Uh, and I think their veterans are particularly susceptible uh, to uh, over prescription. And I would urge you to continue your, your strong vigilance on the problem because it's not going away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We expect votes about 11.45. Ms. Lowy. Thank you very much. Um, Secretary Shinseki, I think you've heard our concern. Uh, frankly, for me, as uh, a citizen, putting aside my role as a congresswoman, it's extraordinary that the secretary that you, a four-star general, and the secretary of defense could go with such distinction and protect our country. But as you said, for four years, there have been ongoing discussion, and we still haven't worked out a seamless transition. So I do hope uh, that Secretary Hagel could match your efforts over at the VA and do what he has to do and get this seamless transition, whether it's the same VISTA program or another one. I almost feel I should call up my 16-year-old grandkids who are such experts at this and say, you know, I can't believe it, but these four-star generals can't figure out how to get rid of this backlog. So I just wish you good luck. And I want to say, Mr. Chairman, um, I do have some concerns about the privatization issue. I understand the desperation among my colleagues, but it's my understanding that 52% of the claims processors are veterans. And it would also seem to me that analyzing the situation, it's not the fault of the claim processors, it's the people at the top. Uh, who can't seem to coordinate and get this system in place. And that would be my concern about even considering uh, private sector contracts. Um, I want to move to a related issue, which is jobs. The unemployment rate for younger veterans ages 18 to 24 has been the highest among all demographics. The projected drawdown in Afghanistan is likely going to exacerbate the situation for our younger veterans. If you could share with us what courses of action you're taking to tackle this particular issue and also discuss 140, 104 million for transition GPS goals, plan success helping separating service members better prepare for their civilian life as they transition. If you could discuss the transition, what we're doing to improve this situation, that's another area that I think is so unconscionable. And frankly, I have several friends in the private sector who are aggressively working on this, getting corporations to hire veterans, but there should be a seamless transition. It should start before they become a veteran, before they are separated from the service. Can you talk about that, please? Certainly, uh, uh, Congressman. Uh, we, we are all focused on the issues of unemployment for veterans um, at large. Uh, for one thing, we hire veterans. Uh, uh, One-third of VA are veterans, fully one-third, and we have a, a goal of uh, moving to 40%. Um, whenever we are in discussion with other uh, agency and department uh, partners, uh, hiring veterans is a discussion as well. We have partnered with the uh, Joining Forces Initiative uh, that's led uh, by out of the White House by the First Lady and Dr. Biden. Um, there, their efforts have been to link in with the private sector and get uh, corporations to provide. The, the goal was 100,000 uh, jobs for uh, service spouses and veterans by the end of, of 2013. That goal was met in 2012, and uh, my understanding is those uh, corporations have committed now to uh, increasing to 250,000 jobs, so a, a lot of momentum there. 
we and VA conduct the hiring fairs. We partner with the Chamber of Commerce, and the Chamber's Hiring Our Heroes campaign uh, has conducted an excess of 400 hiring fairs around the country. Uh, we on our own, besides partnering with the Chamber, have put on three of ours and over w one hiring fair a year. Ours is a, a little more uh, deliberate. Uh, when a veteran shows up, we put them through a resume preparation program. It's automated with us. They describe what they did in the military, and it turns out, in business language, a, uh, a resume. They get to edit it, and then we run it through the uh, system, and they have their own resume to be used for whatever interviews they uh, conduct later. But on site, we also have uh, seasoned interviewers who have interviewed uh, for uh, uh, hiring. Uh, they go through a training program, a process, uh, to uh, rehearse what an interview is about. What, is, what does the interviewer want? What do you want out of the interview? And they get to go through that as many times as they want. And then they go on to the floor where the real job interviews are. And they go for, uh, essentially, for record. Uh, they go to interview one, and if they are not satisfied, they did uh, as best they as they could, they can go back to the training uh, process. Uh, all of it intended for them to leave that day with a job, if that's possible. We have employers on site. Uh, but more importantly, they leave with a resume and skills to be able to do that on their own. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, and good luck. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Lowy. Judge Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Secretary, Mr. Se uh, Mr. Secretary Shinseki, uh General. Thank you for being here. Thank you, all of you, for what you do for our veterans. We, we're frustrated, and we're talking about frustrations that are interesting to me. I came to Congress in 19, uh, in 2002. Uh, when I came to Congress, there were certain things that, that we were demanding needed to be fixed immediately to do with the military, and the number one, was <laughs> the two health plans being able to, being able to function as one and joining together. And it was all, always said VA had the good one, DOD had a bad one, we had to fix them. I've been in Congress 10 years. I've heard exactly the same conversation today that I heard 10 years ago with variations. That, that's very frustrating. Secondly, you, you're talking about you've got about a third of the people in your your agency are veterans. One of the things that, that's been a great joy in my life is to get to know the American soldier. And when I say soldier, I mean warrior. But my reference is Fort Hood, although we have Air Force contingency at Fort Hood also. And one of the things that is a sense of pride for all Americans is how well we have instilled in our soldier, in our warrior, the mission that, that and how the mission is all important, and I have a every soldier has a part of that mission, and that we leave none of our warriors behind, no matter what. And American soldiers die every day meeting that obligation. One of the frustrating things, General, that, that bothers me a lot, and, it, and I know it does you too, is we have veterans today to think the Veterans Administration is leaving them behind. They're, they're being left on that battlefield, and they, they, they are so proud. Talk to veterans groups uh, at home, and they tell you, you know, we, the, we've still got, the, the, the military still cares about us, and they are, are proud of having a, a veterans department that is theirs, theirs. That's why you don't get veterans talking about give me a, a voucher to go to some other hospital. No, I want to be with my guys. That's their whole world. When we fail those veterans, and they felt like they were left on the battlefield, we destroy something that's very important to our country that we've instilled in these people. That concerns me as much as anything we're doing here, is that the average soldier, and I hear it from a lot of veterans today, uh, a whole lot, that with almost with tears in their eyes, I don't think I'm ever going to get this claim finished. I don't think I'm ever going to get my life settled. And I go and I bang my head against the stone wall and nothing happens. I know the frustration. I'm not military trained. 
wish I had that. But I will tell you, one of the things that you, that you as a general know, most of these people may be ex-military, is that you, when you go to, a, to, to complete a mission, whether it be a, a small engagement or a very large scale engagement, you start with certain assumptions of things that need to be accomplished, you get as much intelligence on how to accomplish it as you can, and, you, you, and everybody, then, then the, the commander instills in the, those below him what the ultimate accomplishment is, so you know we're all on the same team, we're going to take that hill, we're going to do this, whatever it takes, whatever the project is. But as you start the proceedings, you run into things that don't fit what you thought was there. There's always that outside influence, that outside thing that makes change. And what you, the, the Army and the military does so well for our soldiers is we train them to adjust, keeping their eye on the mission. You know this. I'm not teaching you anything. You teach it. I know you have. And, and I think the VA has got so much of a relationship to the, to the veterans. That's the way they've got to get this thing fixed, all these things fixed. I, it's like you take a functioning, mission-accomplishing operation and you bureauc bu turn them into bureaucrats, which is let me sit and take care of my little niche and, and let the rest of the world pass me by. Uh, I don't know the solution. I think you do. I have a... Great confidence in you uh, as a leader. Uh, I have, I've told you that more than once since we've met because I knew your reputation from Fort Hood, which is very, you're very highly respected at Fort Hood. And I never hear a bad word about you. Everybody says he's a great Joe, he's a great man. Uh, and and that, I carry that with me. But somehow this VA has start, got to start operating on the missions, and we've got two we're talking about here today that are long-term missions. Not just since you've been there. They've been here since I've been here, and I ain't been here as long as Ms. Loy or the chairman and some of these others around here. And it's a shame that an army that can show the world, a military that can show the world that they can accomplish whatever mission they can do, we, we, we take them out and put them in their organization, and we fail on our missions. Um, I'll tell you, I'm embarrassed that the Great Place, which is, you know what I'm talking about, Fort Hood, we call it the Great Place, has the worst VA record in the country. Olentigue and the Waco, they're number one in backlog. At least they were, unless y'all have fixed it, and I'll, I'll be very blessed to learn if you have. But we made the front page of the papers, the number one worst VA facility in the country for backlog was the one that, that is related to Fort Hood. That's not acceptable for those of us who like to, to say that we produce a great place for, for warriors. And those we want to have them have a great place when they go to the VA. I personally will volunteer, if it'll help, to chew ass once a month, okay, at the VA, if you want me to. I personally will make, I did this with the highway department because I couldn't get them to get off their butt, and I'll do it with the VA. I'm an old trial judge. I know how to do that pretty well. And I will. I'll go. We'll have a meeting every day, and we'll say, we'll, ask, we'll see what's been done, and I tell me why not, and what are you going to change to make it happen? Uh, that's not a question. That's a statement. I believe we, we I want to know why we haven't made those adjustments when we've run into these things, and how can we start making those adjustments and having trained up people that say, I see the goal, I see the, the mission, and I'm going to do this mission. And if I run into a snag, I'm stepping over here and going past it. May I just? Yes, sir, please. I, I, I would say uh, there is no daylight between us, uh, Congressman. I mean, we want the same things. And uh, what you describe is my experience in uniform. And uh, part of the culture change in VA is being uh, having the opportunity uh, to be able to put some of those uh, disciplines and behaviors in place here. So when I talk about training our workforce, it's very much at being able to hold people accountable. If you, if you never train them to the standard, it's hard to hold them accountable because they have no way of getting there. So first requirement is establish a standard and train those folks to it, and that is underway and has been underway for some time. 
Uh, the other is to provide them the tools they've never had. This automation tool is powerful, and uh, it's going to change the way uh, we process claims. Why do I know this? Because in 2009, when I arrived, Congress gifted uh, our veterans with something called the 9-11 GI Bill. Uh, we didn't have a tool for that either. Uh, and Congress said, uh, I arrived in January, and August uh, the program begins. And so I think uh, uh, you'll recall that first semester was uh, pretty tough. It was all done by paper and pencil because we didn't have a tool. Well, that's what's going on in the disability claims program. But at the same time we were doing paper and pencil uh, enrollments, we began developing an automation tool for the 9-11 uh, GI Bill. Uh, that fall semester, we struggled to get 173,000 youngsters enrolled. Today, we have over 900,000 because of this automation tool we developed. Uh, we learned a lot uh, going through that process, but that learning translates into how we are fielding and developing this Veterans Benefits uh, Management System, VBMS, that we've created for our disability uh, claims processing. Same approach, incremental, uh, make sure it works, take the next piece, make sure it works, take the next piece. Uh, it sounds like a long and drawn out process because it's incremental, uh, rather than taking a bit, big bite and something fails and you don't know what caused it. So this way we get to see uh, what the issues are, fix it, and then uh, keep moving on. In, in the long run, it's faster to do it, to do it that way. So I, I would say uh, six months into it, we're 36 of 56 regional offices. Uh, we will be completed with fielding with VBMS, and then we'll have a way of measuring uh, improved performance. Waco, uh, Waco had uh, a good performance record, and and so when we made the decision on Agent Orange, uh, it was one of the places that we went to ask to do extra work. And uh, we saddled it with uh, an additional workload that other uh, regional offices did not receive. Um, and, and frankly, we had to work through it. It took us two years to get all those uh, Agent Orange claims through the system, and some of their claims aged uh, as well. So. Uh, we understood that was going to happen, and uh, and we are now in the process of bringing everyone back online. Well, thank you, and and I, I have absolute confidence in you, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, because I know your your track record. Uh, but I hope that you'll help instill in these the workers at the VA, and and I I go out there two three times a year, and and they're great great people. But let's don't let our soldiers lose their warrior ethos, their belief that our country cares about them will always get them off that battlefield alive. Or, and if not, if they're not alive, their body will go home and won't be left on the battlefield. Uh, it means an awful lot to the future of this country that we keep that going. And um, I don't want us to be the cause, our VA to be the cause of them losing that faith in us. God bless you. That, that very much. I'll help. You let me know. Okay. Uh, I will. That very much resonates with me, uh, uh, Congressman. Uh, let me just say, th this budget, just to demonstrate uh, the amount of energy we're putting into it, this budget is about uh, Veterans Benefits Administration. We've increased their budget by 13.6 percent, and it's about the IT tools that enable them uh, to have those soldiers perform the way you and I uh, recognize. 10.8 uh, percent increase to information technology in this budget. Uh, that's what we need to get to 2015, and without that, we'd be challenged. Thank you, Thank Thank you Mr. Judge. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm, you know, of course, struck that the judge's comments. I couldn't agree with them more. And uh, VA's customers are are uh, are veterans who have served the country. And I always am struck when I visit. If you think about it, just very quickly, for I recognize Mr. Farr, and, and and they've just about just started on a, a series of six votes. And obviously, we'll come back after the end of those votes because members have a lot of questions. And uh, we appreciate your patience. There'll be six votes with a motion to recommit in the middle. So it's going to be an extended series of uh, votes. But just very, very quickly, while the members are here, and I'd like just to, for you to think about it, and I think all the members here, when we visit at home with successful businesses in our districts, talk to the CEOs, the managing, uh, uh, the senior executives in those companies are always focused on the customer. They always talk to us about what they're doing to meet the needs of their customers. And you never hear any discussion about what they're doing in the top office or what they're doing in the 
in the uh, in management or that they've got more money thrown at different uh, sectors of the company. All you hear about is the customer. And I have to say, in three years I've had the privilege of serving the subcommittee, I rarely ever hear any discussion of the customer from the VA's top leadership. And I think that may be one of the, I mean, obviously you're concerned about it, but I mean, if I just could encourage you to shift your mindset so that you're looking at the VA, the military works from the top down, the VA ought to work from the bottom up. And just think about everything that you do in terms of the individual customer, the individual veteran, and what you can do to make sure that, as Judge Carter has said, that they don't feel left behind. I think it would help a lot. It certainly helps in the private sector to stay focused on the customer, and it would help the VA to stay focused on the customer. May I respond? Yes, sir. I, I would say um, I appreciate those comments, and if in four years you have not heard me mention veterans. Oh, no, I have heard you mention them, uh, but I just think in terms of mindset, sir. No, of course I know you're committed. It's not my intent to, not to mean that. I just think in terms of mindset of the agency as a whole, the mindset of the private sector is always focused on the customer and how can we meet their needs. And I just you don't, just don't see that as <laughs> yeah. I think you should, particularly at the VA. Uh, well, I would say that's our only mission, Mr. Chairman. I mean, we, uh, if you look at uh, any of our buildings emblazoned on it is uh, the words of Abraham Lincoln to care for him who was born in the battle. Oh, certainly. I know, of your com I know of your commitment, sir. It's just that there really is a different mindset when you look at listen to the private sector focused on customers with the federal government. I appreciate all that you do. Recognize Mr. Farr, and we'll, of course, come back. Uh, let's go till about five minutes left in the vote, and then we'll uh, uh, recess and come back after the votes. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I have to say that my constituents uh, complain a lot more about banks than they do about uh, Veterans Department of Veterans Affairs, and they think they get a much better treatment. People respond when they uh, ask questions of the Department of Veterans Affairs, and they don't when their house is being foreclosed on and their mortgages are upside down and they can't qualify for other loans. So I think if the private sector is, the, the chairman example, pays attention to customers, it certainly isn't in the financial services industry. And I like, and I, and I want to personally compliment you. I don't think any secretary has done a better job. I mean, you, not only as you told about initiating the GI Bill, but you have been the first secretary to really focus on how to eliminate homelessness for veterans. And that was one of the pledges of this committee many years ago, that we were going to leave no vet behind and we were going to try to get the department to really drill down and do work with the homeless. And you've, you've led the effort on that. You've expanded the disability category. No wonder we have so many fun. I mean, I'm as upset as everybody else about the backlog. But remember, we also, we also gave so many more opportunities for veterans to file. You opened up the disability claims, and you now have veterans filing with five, six, seven more claims per filing uh, issues than uh, previous veterans did. I can understand what created this incredible rush and backlog, and hopefully we will, with your leadership and our mo and money that we appropriate, uh, be able to uh, move on to uh, make this department and it's it's servicing these claims. Um, I also think. Excuse me. I also think the Department of Defense should put some money into it because, you know, they're the ones that caused the problem. So, uh, and I, I'm furious at the fact that they can walk away from a lot of the responsibilities, including paying for uh, uh, making uh, plans work and, and uh, health care plans being interchangeable. Having said that, I, I've been really uh, drilling down late, late, uh, lately just trying to work out the local and state Veterans Affairs offices, and I realize that what's happened in our states, and I served in local government and state government, is they take for granted all the money that goes to the states for veterans. And we, you run, you give these administrative monies to them. It never gets the kind of scrutiny that it does here because it's not a state responsibility. They're not paying for it out of state tax dollars or local tax dollars. And so the review when we were in the legislature and when we were in local government was, oh, that's a federal program that just happens to be housed in our county. And let's move on to something where we really have some authorities and some money in the game. And I think that we need to, you need to use your carrots with these states and local governments to shape them up to be as competent as you'd like to see your own department because uh, I think there's a lot of incompetency and a lot of misinformation uh, that state and local uh, veterans departments uh, have, and, and even whether they care about it. Um, the other thing that, that uh, 
that I'm concerned about is, you know, is that we have in California is that the state doesn't want to pick up the responsibility for state-funded cemeteries. Uh, you and I have had this going around, and I'd just like to re refresh sort of the committee's memory that um, we asked uh, in, in FY13 uh, CR, we had language in there asking the National Cemetery Administration um, that requires the VA to submit a strategy report to the committee on how the VA plans to meet its burial needs for veterans in, in rural areas. Uh, I've really been focused on uh, the under, you know, how, I mean, we do have a lot of veterans uh, uh, clinics and veterans hospitals, but sometimes they're so far away that the veteran uh, can't take advantage of them. Um, and what this uh, report was supposed to do is to include a time frame for implementation of five new burial sites in rural locations. And I just wondered what the status of that report is. Uh, I'm also interested in whether you've included uh, Fort Ord, which was, you know, still in uh, federal uh, hands. Um, I am also uh, would like to urge you again with staff to review this uh, internal policy of of requiring that uh, anything within a 75 mile radius, uh, uh, if there's space available, you can't uh, you can't uh, uh, expand. I mean, you've essentially waived that 75 mile radius when you proposed creating your urban columbarium program in FY11. That program created without congressional approval would allow veterans in urban areas, even though they have access to cemeteries within a 75 mile radius, to uh, create new columbariums, and that that's caused uh, a lot of uh, uh, problems because people are understanding. Well, what if they can do it f in the San Francisco Bay Area? Why can't we do it down in our area? Um, so, uh, I think that also because what that considered that rule did never consider uh, mountains and time to get there. It's just a as the crow flies, and there's there's certainly differences in different parts of the country as to what that how difficult that 75 mile guideline has been. Um, So I would really ask you to look at that and, and revise that definition uh, to reflect more the, the practicality of being able to uh, to get to get there. Um, I, I I've been I've been we're, we're trying to put it all together at, to try to get a uh, state cemetery in California by having the locals. But our veterans have had to go out and do bake sales. They've had golf tournaments. Uh, the state wants about uh, ten million dollars raised out of it. They're not going to make it, and it's just tragic that uh, if we're going to have this program, that we don't use a little bit more of your stick, carrot stick, to make these states step up to the plate and Same take the responsibilities. We spend eighty billion dollars in uh, veterans' benefits go to the state of California. Eighty billion. I mean, that's a huge part of our economy and and we we never get thanks for it and I want to thank you for for uh, being in charge and I want you to use your uh, general uh, 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 leadership to uh, shape up the troops out there shape up my state and local government troops uh, congressman uh, l let me ask uh, uh, Secretary Muro to respond to the specifics of your question regarding rural bur burial policy, and then I look forward to continuing to work with you on uh, trying to meet the uh, requirements for uh, a a solution here that serves veterans in uh, in Monterey. Oh, I'd be remiss also if I didn't ask you uh, on behalf of the Northern California members of Congress uh, bicameral. We would love to have you come visit the Oakland office, which has the l largest backlog in the country. We really, uh, I think your leadership and presence there would make a big difference. Okay, fair enough. Mr. Thank, you. thank you, Secretary. Uh, thank you, Congressman Carr, for that question. Let me start off by saying uh, the customer service. I have the privilege to lead the organization, uh, National Cemetery Administration, the only organization to ever receive a 95 score for customer service not only federal and private sector or state. So we do address our customers and we do work with our veterans uh, to ensure they get what they need 
in the burial benefits and other benefits that they have earned. Uh, we did provide uh, a reply in, uh, to the rural policy. Uh, we submitted the policy. Uh, the urban policy was also approved by the uh, Congress in FY11 in our budget. So we have uh, those two uh, new policies approved. The, uh, the rural policy is looking at areas where we have no VA National Cemetery service, mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking at 25,000 or less veterans that live in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working closely with the states, uh, so they continue to build state cemeteries and we don't interfere in their areas. Okay. Uh, in California, as Congressman, as you know, we've worked closely recently with your staff and with the staff for the state of California. Uh, they've recently, uh, we've worked so close with them, they're actually revising their plan yeah. uh, because they realized they submitted too high of a plan. Uh, they were, yeah, they I'm were familiar with for too high. Uh, and between your staff and my staff, we were able to convince them to submit a better plan that is more realistic uh, so that they can get funded in our state grants program. Mr. Uh, Hart, if I, if I could, members that could not come back, uh, you can ever come back, Sam, afterwards? After votes? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so, no. Well, the, 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 I won't, we've got, I know you want to end this and get time. In. States that aren't interested in building okay, state cemeteries, they need, and that was California's problem, and then they left it up to m myself to devise another method where we're going to get local government to step in for the state. They never took any interest in it. And so it's, it's been kind of a really a mess because the locals didn't know how much money they had to put up. They didn't know all the, we need to use your authorities if you're gonna go out and get these states and even California to use your muscle and say, you know, look at how much we're putting into this state. And you gotta shape up and be much more responsible in, in helping. They, they never did anything to implement it. They just stood back and watched. Well, we've and now we've beaten the hell out of them and they're paying some attention. Well, we support your, uh, we appreciate your support, but I know that uh, we, the secretary sent the governor a letter, uh, encourage him to uh, uh, build this state cemetery in Monterey. So we are working Con closely with Congressman. I'll, I'll pick up on that. We're, yeah. We've got more. But it should here. have been the feds that built it. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Rooney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know our time is very limited. I just wanted to uh, echo a lot of what's already been said, uh, General. I might be the only one that serves on this committee that actually served under you and you were the chief of staff and I was a young, much skinnier captain down at Port Hood. But um, uh, so it's, 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 a, it's an honor to be here uh, getting the chance to address you as a member of Congress. Um, you know, one of the hardest parts of my job and I represent South Central Florida and St. Petersburg uh, Regional Office, uh, w I was told had the sad distinction of being one of the largest backlogs uh, in the in the whole country. And one of the hardest parts of my job, I'm sure everybody else here, is when you, we get these constituent service issues that come into our regional, our district offices, and it deals with, you know, my backlog, my claim, it's been so long, and, and we're making excuses almost for you uh, of why things are taking so long, and you sort of run out of answers. And, and, and when we're trying to work together, um, it just gets very frustrating. And I think that you've heard a lot of that up here today. I certainly have a lot of retirees in South Florida. Um, so a lot of my questions don't deal with banks, they deal with uh, the, the, the VA. So um, I'm encouraged by a lot of the things that I've heard up here today with regard to the integrated computer system. We came into government together as far as uh, up here. I came in in 08 as well. And, and you know, I heard you testify in, in the Veterans Committee about doing this then. So, I mean, the time, the time to move forward, hopefully 2015 is realistic. But, uh, and I know that you've added on a lot of things. But I, I would disagree with one thing that you said, and then I'm going to yield, is um, you said that there's, you know, sort of a separation between DOD and the VA when it comes to their lane of providing national security and yours as taking care of the, the, the um, people after they get out. I think there is a correlation. I, I think that people will see, certainly if we're not doing what George Washington said, taking care of the people that serve our country as a reflection of who we are as a nation, then why the hell would they join the military if they're going to see that once they get out, they're not going to be taken care of? So uh, again, it's been, it's been an honor to serve under you, sir, and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for you. 
And, uh, but it, we've had to make a lot of excuses to our constituents that's just getting very, very cumbersome. I don't know why DOD and the VA doesn't do one single computer system, as Mr. Bishop said, you know, from enlistment until death. Um, I, I don't get that. But anyway, thank you very much. I don't have a question. Uh, I'm going to yield to Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, Mr. Secretary, pleasure to see you, and thank you all for coming today. And I regret our time is so compressed, so I'm just going to throw out a few points for your consideration, and you may not have to, time to respond. First of all, hiring our heroes. Thank you for partnering that. This is very important. It is an absolute scandal that there's an 11 percent unemployment rate among veterans, perhaps higher, given that the national average is perhaps 8 percent or, or, or higher. We had a very successful event back in my district in Nebraska. Uh, the willingness of the private sector to partner to look for people with leadership and technical skills that are coming out of the military, I think is something that we continue, must continue to unpack and expand and, and promote. Good program, so thank you for working on that. I have a question regarding the current capacity of our system. If we're at a high watermark in terms of the number of veterans coming through, what those projections look like over time, and that, of course, begs questions about future capacity and shifts of capacity. Related to that, in Omaha, we've got a VA hospital where the operation room is closed because it uh, is potentially dangerous uh, because of the shabby condition of it. The new hospital in Omaha is t at least 10, perhaps 15, or maybe more years of, uh, away in terms of construction. You've got a lot of projects ahead of that, many of which concentrate in California. It'd be helpful for us to continue to understand you know, how we move forward in a more aggressive way to get a facility that, that makes sense there. I have a related question regarding how the VA is beginning to look creatively with at partnering with other institutions to carry on the important legacy of uh, better targeted services to in, in the medical sphere for veterans, exclusively for veterans, but perhaps in full partnership with other institutions that could actually help you deliver effective services and save money. We, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the vote is uh, closed, so we're, uh, we will recess. I think there'll be a couple of members coming back to have additional questions. Uh, thank you very much. If you can, uh, the committee will stand recessed. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I really do appreciate your staying around uh, to be able to address some pretty important issues. Uh, Sonny Montgomery was a man who served honorably in this body and dedicated his entire career to making sure that veterans had the benefits and care that they had earned. Uh, we have a hospital in Mississippi that bears his name. And in March, the Office of the Special Counsel, whose responsibility is to handle complaints from whistleblowers, uh, issued a report, uh, and I'll just quote from that report. Uh, Ms. Carolyn Lerner says that, quote, collectively, uh, these disclosures raise questions about the inability of this facility to care for veterans in its services. And I understand that investigations are still underway. Uh, we may be moving in the right direction, but we have a long, long way to go. Uh, our veterans deserve the best medical services, and I'm not really sure why we have these same problems year in and year out. Uh, I'll give you a chance to respond to, to the overall issues raised in that report, but I'd also like you to respond specifically. Uh, can you, somebody give me an update on the special counsel's investigation on the failure of the VA radiologist to properly read or even read at all uh, thousands of x-rays and MRI, MRIs and have the affected patients been contacted? Uh, Congressman, let me uh, call on Dr. Petzl to provide a uh, response here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Congressman Nunley, the, uh, to respond directly to and specifically to the <coughs> issue of radiology, um, the uh, this is a three-year-old item that has been investigated by the VA and by the Inspector General on three different occasions and uh, have uh, verified the fact that there was really, in essence, no patient harm directed at this. Um, the uh, Special Counsel has asked us to take another look at it, and we are having another external review of those uh, radiographs that were, were called into question. But to speak a little bit more broadly about uh, about uh, Jackson, we obviously are uh, are committed to providing the very best care we can for America's veterans, and ensuring that that care meets the highest standards of quality. The VA has a national reputation for the quality and safety of its programs. Um, the issues that have been raised there by the special counsel there were five of them. Uh, three have been closed. Two are in the very end stages of investigation and being closed. New management there, I think, has addressed the problems that uh, existed, and um, the the hospital is is isn't now a very very good hospital. Its quality s scores over the last year are excellent. It's been reviewed by 48 external agencies and groups in the last 18 months, all of which have given it a very clean bill of health including the Joint Commission. This is a good hospital. So as a follow-up, you say there, there was no patient harm. Is it the VA's contention that these allegations that these, these x-rays and MRIs that the delays were not read were in fact read? Or are you saying that they were not read and there was no patient harm in the fact that these were not properly read? Oh, there were, uh, Congressman, there were x-rays that were not read or maybe not read Properly, what I'm saying is that as a result of that, there was no patient harm. Now I'm really confused. If I'm a patient and my x-rays are not read, how can there be no harm? It may have been a routine chest x-ray. But first of all, let me make it clear. We don't want anybody's x-ray to not be read in a timely fashion. And that is not the case at the Jackson VA any longer. But if it's a routine chest x-ray, and it's not read or it's read uh, a week or two weeks later, that is not going to harm the patient. Is that the same expectation that you would have in a civilian hospital, that you have routine x-rays that are never read? Oh, absolutely not. As I just said uh, prior to that statement, that we expect that uh, the x-rays to be read the same day in a timely fashion, absolutely. And that's the standard that Jackson is performing at right now. But there's no patient harm if the x-rays were not read. The example I gave, I think, uh, okay. Congressman Nunley stands. All right, let me move on to a, a second report. The, the Veterans Administration Office of the Inspector General uh, 
uh, issued a, another report uh, with several areas of deficiencies, uh, including deficiencies in cleanliness, uh, medications not having proper labels, uh, et cetera. Uh, what's being done in that, in the area to address that report? Yeah, uh, Congressman Nunley, could you give me a little bit more specifics about what that investigation was? All right, I've got in front of me, it's the, uh, the Veterans Affairs uh, Office of the Inspector General report dated February 17, 2013. Uh, eight evaluations. Uh, it says five were not reported in a timely manner. Uh, in addition, for all 12 months, the standard of continuing care stay reviews was not met. In addition, regarding the f facility's ability to maintain a clean and safe health care environment, the Office of the Inspector General had several findings, including two of nine areas that were inspected that were not clean, and in four units, medication bottles did not have the proper labeling or exp expiration dates. I, uh, Congressman, I understand now you're talking about the uh, comprehensive um, annual, I mean, uh, every three-year review that the Inspector General does. It's, we call it the CAP review. That was actually a very good CAP review report. There were some findings. Um, the finding, there were, were fewer findings than we see on average with a CAP review around the uh, country. And the organization, the medical center, has in place now a, uh, a uh, solution to uh, uh, fixing each one of those uh, individual recommendations. We uh, rely on the, uh, the CAP reviews to help us ensure that we're doing the high quality care that we expect to do and that our veterans deserve. And we take those recommendations that they come up with very seriously. But this was, in, in essence, a good cap review for the Jackson Medical Center. It's one of the external reviews that I referred to earlier. All right, and Mr. Secretary, I've got a more general question. I continue to hear from veterans that I represent that have great difficulty in obtaining access to specialists uh, as, as opposed to general care. Uh, and I still haven't figured out why that, that's occurring. Uh, are you aware of other problems around the nation with access to, uh, to specialty medical care? Uh, Congressman, I, I would say that uh, if you were to look back over the past four years, a tremendous investment on our part is to provide telehealth, telemedicine connection so that uh, wherever a veteran enters our health care system, if there isn't a specialist located at that facility, and, and there's always, uh, you know, with the uh, number of specialists we have, uh, we don't have them at each uh, outpatient clinic. So wherever they enter, they can have access to that uh, distant uh, location where the specialist may be uh, located. Uh, th this year, we are investing another $460 uh, million to make this a vibrant connection between our hospitals, our community-based outpatient clinics that are located in communities uh, where veterans live, um, 300 or so vet centers and probably 80 mobile vans that uh, travel to the most remote areas. Uh, all of this uh, connected by telehealth, telemedicine hookups to, to address the problem that uh, yeah. you brought up. Uh, I, I, you know, as I say, a uh, veteran, no, ma no matter where he or she lives, uh, deserves to have access to the best health care we have in our system, whether they're in a remote rural area or in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and that's uh, my personal goal. Well, thank you. And as has been articulated by other members of this subcommittee, I look forward to working with you to make sure that the men and women who have defended freedom get uh, every bit of the benefits in health care that they've earned. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Congressman. Thank you very much, Mr. Nunley. Mr. Patel? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for, first of all, I think that the work that you have done has uh, been extraordinary. Uh, given the challenges uh, that the VA uh, faced when you uh, walked in the door uh, and having an entirely uh, paper-based uh, system and the fact that you're processing over a million claims a year and that you have uh, put in place, uh, I think, um, uh, 
uh, every, for every reason for us to believe that you're going to be able to achieve your goals by 2015. So I want to thank you not only for your previous service, which has always been heralded, but your service as uh, leading the VA. Uh, the chairman and I worked together on another subcommittee, uh, and we created a neuroscience uh, collaboration uh, among a number of agencies that has uh, been in place for the last year. The VA has been uh, one of the leading uh, participants uh, looking at a whole set of initiatives around what we can do about hundreds of brain diseases and disorders. And I want to thank the chairman publicly for his uh, help. There's always this notion around here that we don't act in bipartisan ways, and it's actually not the truth. We get a lot done. And um, this is an initiative that I've talked to you about over breakfast. Uh, your work with the Epilepsy uh, the Centers for Excellence and uh, the other work on uh, TBI, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, then in your budget, you have a number of uh, important uh, areas that we want to continue to make sure receive the appropriate uh, level of support. I think that the public is not aware that a large number of, a large percentage of our returning uh, veterans who have been injured have suffered uh, uh, brain injuries. And I was at the uh, Intrepid Center uh, looking at some of the work being done there. So if you could make some uh, comments on the record about this particular area of work that the VA is focused on, because it has not just applications inside the VA for the veterans you're serving, but also for the general public. You know, there are 1.8 million traumatic brain injuries in the civilian population. Uh, young people, a lot of times, who are engaged in a lot of activities and uh, end up being injured. So a lot of what you've learned uh, is applicable uh, over on the civilian side, too. So thank you for your uh, testimony today. I'd be glad to hear your response. Congressman, I'm going to call on, uh, on Dr. Petzl here to uh, provide some details specifically about the res research and brain. But I would just say overall, we're requesting this year $586 million uh, and 14. Uh, for research projects. We have probably in priority about 2,200 uh, projects that we have identified we want to work on. Uh, things we go after are uh, the unique needs of veterans, and that usually refers to PTSD and traumatic brain injury, um, uh, pain and prosthetics uh, with focus on uh, veterans coming out of the current conflicts, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. But what we learn there in prosthetics applies to vast generations. Uh, homelessness, uh, uh, women veterans. Uh, we know that uh, in VA we are s about 6% women uh, veterans today. In the active force, it's 15%. So we know there's a flow of veterans coming to us. And we don't have a lot of background in res research and uh, women's health issues. We need to be out ahead of this. And so that's another priority. Uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Petzl specifically to address the, the brain research. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Secretary. Congressman, I want to thank you and the chairman for your interest and your energy around the brain sciences and the research efforts around brain sciences. This is an effort that is certainly going to very directly affect the health and the well-being of America's veterans. It, for reasons like what you cited earlier in the number of people that are returning with, uh, with uh, brain injuries of some kind. You know, there are 50,000 uh, people who have been evaluated for uh, mild to moderate traumatic brain injury. 34,000 of them, uh, veterans, have been positive. So this is really going to have an impact on, on our community, and we appreciate it. I would just tell you briefly um, what, how the VA is engaged in this effort. Uh, first of all, we have about $123 million worth of research that is being directed at mental health issues, many of which will have direct impact on these uh, on the neuroscience uh, research projects that are going on. Most specifically, DOD and uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs are engaged in a joint effort um, under the aegis of the President's executive order to uh, each commit $50,000 uh, over five years to efforts to develop research in PTSD and traumatic brain injury, specifically focusing on trying to develop markers, biologic markers, uh, for those two illnesses. One, to assist us in making the diagnosis, and two, to help mark the progress in therapy with these uh, veteran patients who have uh, come back from war with these uh, sort of unseen, if you will, injuries. 
Thank you. And just to clean the record, you meant $50 million each. I, I did. What did okay. I say? 50000 Oh, thank you. Yes, 50 uh, million. Um, I appreciate that. the provision of services. And I have a young man in my office in Philadelphia who handles uh, Veterans Affairs who served in multiple tour tours in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq and was injured on his, uh, uh, in his last tour. And some 59 operations later, uh, is uh, healthy. He's got a better golf score than me. He just got married. He's going to have his uh, first child um, and uh, is in graduate school. All of this because of the, the work of the VA is making possible uh, in terms of his continuation of care and so on. And that represents a story that you could tell all over the country. And even as we talk about this backlog, I want to make sure that the record is clear that for each returning veteran, there's five years of health care. This is without having nothing to do with the processing of uh, their claim, so that the health needs are being met immediately. Is, is that correct? Uh, that's correct, Congresswoman. So I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member uh, for holding this hearing and dealing with this. There's no more important subject matter. And, um, and again, let me thank you publicly uh, for you and uh, Chairman Wolf and your willingness to work with me on this neuroscience initiative, uh, which I think is going to uh, vastly improve our ability to address a whole host of challenges uh, related to brain diseases and disorders. Thank you. It's tremendously important work that I'm proud to work with you on, and uh, it is also a pleasure to work with you in support of the sciences, the medical and scientific research that uh, we both have uh, real passion for on that committee, the space program. Uh, we, we do. Uh, the press is not accurate. The public has an impression we don't uh, work together, and, and actually we do. And We've done some great work together, and it's going to be meaningful in millions of people's lives. So Absolutely. Thank you. We do appreciate it. And I also really appreciate Mr. Fatah bringing home a point that I can't uh, reemphasize enough, and that is the tremendous successes. That the, what a blessing you are for the lives of so many veterans and their families and the health care that you provide. I, can, I also hear... Uh, almost nothing but glowing reports of the work that's done by the VA hospitals. We're all frustrated with the backlog of disability claims, but that's a, that's a separate issue, as Mr. Fatah says, from the health care that you provide as the veteran leaves the service and goes into a VA hospital. The DeBakey facility that's in Houston, Texas, uh, they're just nothing but rave reviews and great work that's being done down there. And to thank all of you publicly and to reiterate my good friend's uh, quite appropriate comments because we're also stirred up about the disability claims. Uh, we neglected uh, and should have focused on just saying thank you again, A, for all that you do, B, certainly for that, for that health care uh, service that you provide uh, and all the help we can provide you to speed up the disability process. <clears throat> well said. Thank you. I would like to, if I could, uh, we're going to have to clear the committee room here shortly, but I did want to follow up, if I could, uh, Secretary Shinseki, and it would be very, very helpful, I think, for the record and for the uh, moving forward on the unification of the medical uh, unified medical record. Uh, I wanted to ask you, sir, if you could definitively and clearly um, endorse for the record um, that it would, do you, do you believe it would be uh, a good idea for there to be a common system chosen by both departments, DOD and VA? And we would like you to just be very clear and uh, we hope you would in endorse and support that idea. And if the, both departments do not choose a common system, why shouldn't Congress insist that they, they do so? Uh, I think uh, Congress has uh, registered uh, uh, their uh, concerns and interest on this uh, in prior. And I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's reflected uh, in the actions of Secretary Gates and I, Secretary Panetta and I, and now uh, about to uh, uh, enter into uh, discussions with Secretary Hagel. Uh, we have committed to a single, joint, common, integrated electronic health record. Um, we don't want to have two systems, and so we are working on how to put this in place. Uh, we've also committed, uh, two departments in past discussions, to an initial operating ca capability in, uh, in San Antonio and uh, in the Tidewater uh, region of, uh, of Virginia. Uh, initial operating capability in 2014. So there is a uh, expectation that we're going to show some progress. 
and you share that opinion. This would be a far better, uh, far, far more beneficial to veterans and uh, better for the taxpayers uh, that the DOD and VA adopt one system. I, I, uh, I agree with that. Uh, the, are you aware of any uh, technical reasons why some one system could not be adapted to meet the meets, needs of both departments? I'm not aware of uh, uh, impediments. Uh, are there uh, opportunities to improve what we have? That, that will be ongoing, Mr. Chairman. When we in VA first fielded uh, this electronic health record in 1997, uh, it took us perhaps seven years to get it fully up and running and integrated throughout our operations. Uh, it cost about four billion dollars, but the return on investment has been seven billion. Uh, our health care quality has gone up, safety has gone up because uh, physicians have access to a medical record that they had probably access on 60 percent of the time. Uh, our vaccinations for uh, veterans over 65 uh, was trailing the country in 1997. Today we, we lead the country well into the 90s. So it has a cost benefit, a health care benefit, and safety to veterans. Uh, I think uh, uh, this is all good news for uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. What, how much, do, Mr. Secretary, do you anticipate it will cost to make the necessary modernizations to your VISTA electronic health record? And uh, now that you and the DOD have decided to go to two different paths, your budget requests $344 million for the electronic health record. Do you expect that number to change as DOD selects its own system? Yeah, I, I uh, await a discussion with uh, Secretary Hagel on, on uh, since this is a joint uh, project, on how uh, these numbers uh, will uh, shake out. But our 2014 budget request accommodates what uh, we expect is our need and that is uh, uh, $344 million that will cover our requirements in, in uh, 2014. Well, I know the Congress, uh, all of us feel very strongly, need a unified uh, medical record and hope you, you'll continue to pursue that and we'll certainly help you with it. Let me ask a couple of quick questions for my uh, good friend and colleague, Bill Young, and then, uh, and then uh, pass uh, back to my good friend from Georgia. Uh, Chairman Young has asked, um, he said he can't. He is not here today and regrets it very much because he's chairing a hearing of his subcommittee with the commanders of U.S. Central Command and our forces in Afghanistan. However, he did ask me if I could ask you to comment on three issues related. You good? Okay. No more questions. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, let me just ask you quickly, uh, uh, Chairman Young, and I'll submit these for the record uh, to you in writing so you can answer Chairman Young and more. Um, uh, more specifically, um, he, is, uh, he understands that the point system that's being used to measure the output of claims processes has resulted in some employees uh, cherry-picking claims, going to do the easy ones first because they can get more points for them. Chairman Young has asked for your thoughts on this uh, system and how widely uh, used the point system is within the VA system. I'm going to call on uh, Secretary Hickey here to uh, provide some detail. I, I would just say, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, when we imposed the uh, Agent Orange decision, it, it, it slowed things down. And so uh, we are now uh, trying to get the oldest claims moving and get that uh, in, uh, you know, in the queue. Uh, I think there's a good opportunity to do this. Uh, I don't profess to know everything that goes on in the, in the claims processing mm -hmm. uh, business. I've not heard of uh, the, the cherry picking phrase, but uh, you know, I, I, let me just ask Secretary Hickey to comment. Thank, Thank you, Chairman, uh, for the question. Uh, we do rely on a point system for doing uh, claims and for production uh, requirements for our staff. Um, however, we have heavy engagement uh, and oversight from our coaches who are the supervisory positions within those smaller teams. Um, and, and they are engaged in actually making sure work is distributed in a fair and equitable way. Um, but we are uh, also looking at now that we're moving into a new environment where our productivity is increasing and where we're now in our new segmented lanes across the board nine months ahead of plan uh, in our new Express Corps and Special Operations. We're literally today uh, in conversations uh, with our uh, employees, uh, rep representatives on what we can do around our point systems to increase productivity 
um, uh, with our employees and to also focus heavily on quality. But he also asked, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. yes, I sir. I could just add to that. Certainly. One of the benefits of having an automation uh, system is that uh, to the question you asked, we, we can now see individual performance by uh, our uh, uh, claims uh, adjudicators. And uh, we can begin to focus in on what's going on. Right now, with all that paper, it's hard to see. And you get anecdotal reports, then you go uh, charge off the check. Uh, but uh, one of the benefits here of the automation system, which is what uh, we want, is to be able to manage and uh, be able to uh, acknowledge uh, where we have issues that we have to go to work on. Chairman Young has also asked about the paperless uh, claim system, and he's being told by constituents that are uh, concerned that the system is uh, actually slowing down the, uh, uh, the claims uh, uh, process. Uh, could you comment on that and also uh, whether or not you have found it uh, uh, difficult to uh, hire enough people? He's wondering, is there a staffing problem within the VA disability system, uh, Ms. Hickey, and if so, what are you doing to solve the problem? So if you could answer those two about slowing down the, the uh, paperless process, slowing down the claims process, and, and, and staffing. Yeah, I, you know, we, we are fielding a new system, and as you field, I, I do think you have a little degradation in the work efficiency. I mean, for those of us that have gotten a new computer with a new program on it, or even mm -hmm. changed our password, you know, where the old password is a, you know, automation, uh, you know, the quick run of the fingers, uh, it, it slows us down until we get into the rhythm of it. I think, you know, the man-machine interface here, that is true, there's a little bit of degradation. But once you get through that period, and it's a short period, uh, the power of the uh, microprocessor gives you a much better return uh, for that uh, momentary loss of uh, efficiency. Uh, let me turn to Secretary Hickey for the second part of the question. So, Chairman, we're actually um, uh, right now uh, staffed at 101.4 percent of our authorization, um, and so we are, we, we are fully staffed. Our attrition rate, frankly, in VBA is very low. In fact, if the standard for all of federal government is 17 percent, right now our attrition is about 6 percent. So, and, uh, and we are hiring an awful lot of veterans. In fact, last year, FY12, uh, 82 percent of everyone we hired in our regional offices was a veteran. So we're very focused on uh, bringing veterans into uh, a work environment and also into an environment where they continue to care for one another. That's marvelous. I deeply appreciate uh, y'all's your service to the country. Mr. Bishop, any further questions? I will have some further questions for the record. We'll submit them to, uh, to the record. Uh, let me thank all of you for your attendance, Mr. Secretary, and uh, we know that you have a very, very difficult uh, challenge that, that you face uh, in behalf of uh, uh, looking after those who have looked after us. Uh, you know that all, all too well. Uh, and so we look forward to continuing to work with you uh, to meet these challenges, but uh, we cannot uh, at all uh, not uh, hold ourselves, uh, hold the department accountable uh, for taking care of uh, the veterans because they've sacrificed so much uh, for the freedoms that we uh, enjoy. And we want to make sure that uh, we do right by them. Thank you very much. And I do uh, want to reiterate uh, Mr. Bishop's uh, gratitude. We, are, we admire you deeply, appreciate so very much your service to the country, and look forward to working with you to help you make sure that our veterans have the best uh, health care in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to both of you and the ranking member for support over a number of years now. And uh, I, I want to assure you we're cited on what's right here, and that's to uh, take care of this claims backlog. We have a plan. This year's budget uh, looks for resources to allow us to do that. So thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.